Well, I'm excited to get into this message today, beginning a brand new series today called Upper Hand. I want to teach you how to win while you're waiting. We're all in a season of waiting. We want to learn how to win while we're, while we're waiting, all right? So I got friends up here on the stage, amen corner. We're going to win while we're waiting, right? We're going to win. Anybody like waiting? No, none of us. We none like waiting. I, I thought I'd start out this message with um, uh, an illustration from one of the greatest movies of all time. It, I, don't, I don't know how many awards it went off of its cinematography and um, its <laughs> um, off of its acting and you know just its uh, storytelling ability. But it's called Over the Top by Sylvester Stallone. I was thinking about this after the first service burst. Did you say you've never seen it? I failed you. How long? You've been here almost a decade. As a leader, I feel like I've, I failed you in somehow as a leader that he hasn't watched over the top yet. So it's with, uh, you know, one of the greatest actors of all time, Sly. Come on, somebody. Rocky. But it's called Over the Top. And here's the thing. Sylvester Stallone plays um, a guy named Lincoln Hawk who's a long haul truck driver and, and he's also an arm wrestler. And in his truck, he has a pulley system where he can like, you know, get his, his arm wrestling muscles ready to go. But he wears this hat, like literally, like all of my campus pastors have this to remember, you know, sometimes you gotta work while you're waiting. Come on, somebody. And so, uh, but here's the thing he does. He puts on the hat. I'm not gonna put it on because um, I don't mess up the hair. But he puts on the hat. He wears it all the time and these cutoff shirts all the time. And when it comes time for him to like go to an arm wrestling situation, he spins the hat around. Like there's a moment, you know, the, 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 music is just, the music's just right and he goes. And when he spins the hat, he be, he's not Lincoln Hawk anymore. He is this arm wrestling phenom. And then every time, every single time, every single time, if you see the movie, every time he's about to lose. Because anytime you got a Sylvester Stallone movie, he can't just win outright. He's got to be on the door of death, about to die, and then he comes back and wins, right? And so he's about to lose the arm wrestling every time. And then he does this thing where he does his fingers like this. And then he, bam, he wins every single time. It works every time. And I was just thinking about this in life, is that you and I, we're all wrestling something. And here's the deal. Before the crisis ever hit, we were all wrestling some things, wrestling fear, wrestling anxiety, wrestling doubt, maybe wrestling with some relational issues that we were dealing with, wrestling with career, wrestling with purpose, like what's my purpose in life? Like why am I here? What, what am I investing my life in? And we're all wrestling in different areas of our life. And, and, and to compound the issue, what has happened is that the pause button has been hit on our life. And so now I just believe that those things we've been kind of wrestling with ourselves have just gone to another level. Because now we may have been dealing with a little bit of anxiety before and we were able to manage it and kind of deal with it. But now like can't even leave the house and now we're anxious about this virus and we're anxious about our money and we're anxious and it's just gone to like another level in our life. And so we're wrestling on another level with these things. And, and here's the deal that's hard about it is like the pause button has been stopped so we're all waiting. We're just waiting. We're waiting on answers. We're waiting on when is this going to open back up? When it, we're waiting on, it, will I have a job when I get back from this? We're just, we're just waiting so much unknown and there's nothing we can do about it. Like we can't control any of it. And in the waiting, I found that we do a couple of things. Some of us, we worry in the waiting. And in the waiting moments, we just worry about it. Some of us, um, we not only, not only worry, but we grow weary in the waiting, right? Like we just get tired of it. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm a little bit over all this. Anybody else with me? Like, I don't know. It just, I'm like over it. I'm done. And so you grow weary in the waiting. Some of us, we withdraw in the waiting. Um, some of us, we go wacko in the waiting. <laughs> I just needed another W. Um, but some of you are really, you're going wacko. They got, they got video counseling. You should try. Um, we got a little wacko in the waiting, but here's the deal. In the waiting, and I've heard this and I've said this, when is this going to go back to normal? And here's the deal, it's not going back. And in your life, you shouldn't want to go back. You should want to advance to the next thing that God has for you. But here's the reality. It does no good to even wish in the waiting. You know, I text some friends of mine uh, on Friday, I think it was. A picture of us eating at a restaurant and I said remember the days when you used to eat out at restaurants 
Like, remember, remember way back when, everybody, when we ate out at restaurants, I was just like, oh, I'm so over this. I'm wishing I was back, but wishing doesn't produce. And here's what I'm concerned is that some of us that were wasting the waiting, that we're wasting it, that we're just like, hoping we can do enough Netflix and it'll be over eventually, or we can Hulu through the thing, or we can, whatever your choice is, that, that we're just, and we're just kind of wasting it, and, and we're going to come out on the other side of it, not, not better and stronger, but bitter and weaker. And here's my concern for us, is that some of us are creating habits in this season that we're going to have to undo in the next season. That, that we're creating some bad patterns right now in our life that we're picking up, that, that now we've been doing them for six weeks and then we're gonna do them for seven weeks and then all of a sudden it's gonna be time to get back to a new rhythm and a new routine and we're gonna be like, oh, now I gotta undo all the mess I did in this season of waiting because we're wasting the waiting. And I just wanna say to you, you don't have to waste the waiting. I believe you can win in the waiting. You can win in the waiting. That you can come out of this. I don't know about you. I've determined I'm going to come out on the other side stronger and better. I'm going to come out more clear on my purpose. I'm going to come with my values aligned better. That I'm just going to search some things. God, do something. I'm going to come out more in love with Jesus. I want to win in the waiting. I don't want to waste it. I don't want to look back and one day be like, what did I do in that period other than send funny memes to my friends? Come on, somebody, we've all done it. Right, <laughs> send some funny memes. Hey. <laughs> and so I want us to look at the Apostle Paul. Thank you. I want us to look at the Apostle Paul who, um, who I believe w- was abil- had the ability to win in the waiting. And it's found in Philippians. I want to read to you, if you don't have a copy of the Bible with you, um, uh, text 94,000 to LC Connect, and we'll send you a Bible, all right? Um, but if you have one in your house, grab it. For Philippians chapter 1, start reading in verse 12. It says this, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. I'll tell you in a moment what's happened to him. And as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Man, that's what I'm praying for every one of you. I'm praying that in this season, you get the courage to speak the word of God more fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. And the latter, the ones speaking out of goodwill, they do so in love, knowing that I am but here I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former, those who are doing it out of rivalry or envy, they preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincere. They're supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in change. But he says this, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is being preached. And because of this, listen to what Paul said, because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death, for me To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Let me give you the picture here of what's happening, is that Paul in this moment, he is in prison, and um, he's not in prison as as you may think about it, but he's he's under house arrest, and he's been there, he's going to be, by the time his house arrest is over, it's for two years, so Paul understands what it is to be um, quarantined. (laughs) Come on, somebody. Paul knows what it is to be in a stay-at-home order, right? Like, but, but he can't even like, leave to go to the grocery store like, like you and I can. Like, he has to like, stay under house arrest. Matter of fact, the text says that even it's becoming apparent to the palace guards. So, so like, he wasn't just like, in his house like, with a little ankle bracelet where he could get out and go. He was like, palace guard, stop there. He's under house arrest. He's not going anywhere, getting out, nothing, nada. Are y'all following me? Like, y'all with me? Like... He's not leaving. 
And so he, he understands quarantine. He understands being on a stay-at-home order. And I think Paul understands something else about what we're all experiencing in this season because he's experiencing it. And that is this word, it is loss. It's lost. Now, here's what you've got to understand is that Paul planted like all kinds of these churches. So a lot of the New Testament, these, these what we call them books of the Bible, Philippians, Ephesians, Galatians, they're called um, epistles. The word epistle means a letter or a message. And um, so he would write these out to these churches. So Paul was like a serial entrepreneur church planner. Right. All right. So he would like plant like in Ephesus and then he's moving on this, you know, Galatia, and then he's moving on to Philippi, and then he's moving on to Corinth, and then he would write letters back to them to kind of like train and pastor them along the way, and so that's what's happening. So this is one of those letters, but he, he couldn't be with them, so Paul understands loss because I'm sure he, and he often says it, I would much rather be with you than writing you, and so Paul has lost some things, and, and, and we've lost in this season. We haven't lost, but we have lost some things. I've never lost in Christ, but I've lost some things. Like, like I, I just want to hug somebody. Like, or for real, like, I just want to like hug someone. Um, we, you know, it's just weird. Like, I want to, I know it's so, say it's so menial, but like, I want to go eat somewhere. Like, like at a restaurant, you know, where you don't have to clean up the plates. Come on, somebody. Like, where you don't have to do any dishes. Uh, I just... I, I want to get on a plane. Like, I would take the back row of coach right now. Like, that's where I'm at. I would take the, the one by the bathroom in the back in coach. Y'all, y'all with me? Like, I'm a little bougie when I travel. I'll be real. But I would even take the back row right now. Like, I don't even need an exit row. Like, I'm just, I'm so, and we've lost some things. And some of you, you've lost some things. Not so trivial as eating out or traveling. Like, some of you lost the job. Or you've lost opportunity with people. Because you, you can't go see them and be with them in the way that you want to be with them. And um, some of you, you've lost, you've lost people. Like the virus has taken somebody from you. Or in the midst of this, something else has taken someone's life. And because of your distance, you couldn't be there. And so we're all losing. We've all lost something on some level in this. But here's... What I'm learning from Paul and realizing in this season is that I get to choose my losses on some level. I get to choose my losses on some level. I don't don't necessarily get to choose. Some of them have been forced upon me. Like like, um, next week, I was supposed to preach in Australia for the first time. I was pretty excited about that. Like I've never been to Australia, never been to the Gold Coast. I was like, I get to go preach in Australia. And that was taken away from me, and there's nothing I can do about that. And I'm not crying about it, like, you know. But it was an opportunity missed. And, and so I can't control that. I can't control that I can't go out to eat. I can't control that we can't go visit certain people. We can't control that we can't go see Tammy's grandfather in the nursing home. We, we just, there's a lot of things that I can't control. But, but what I'm concerned is that, is that we're letting go of the things we can control in this season. Like, I can't control that I can't go out and do some certain things, but I can control that I don't lose my joy in this season and that I don't lose my peace in this season and that I don't lose hope in this season. And for some of us, it seems like since we can't control some things, we have let go of control of everything. And we don't have to live that way. And, and Paul tells us, Paul was, he was living for something so much larger in this. And so he says in the middle of it, I'm in chains, so I rejoice. I rejoice. And he says, and yes, I'll continue to rejoice. And so even though Paul was under house arrest, and even though Paul couldn't see people, and even though Paul had to write these letters and couldn't visit the churches, and even though Paul had palace guards that were watching over him, and even though all this was going on, Paul said, I rejoice. And listen to me. Paul's joy didn't come from his circumstances. It was the result of his confidence. His confidence wasn't in his circumstances. His confidence was in something that was greater than the dilemma and greater than the drama that he was facing in the moment. 
Paul was living for something so much larger. Listen to me. I want to say this to you today. You've got to live for something that is larger than this, this little thing, this right now, this momentary thing. Some of us are living so myopic that all we can see is just like this thing that is just right in front of us right now. And I just want to encourage us that there's something bigger that's happening here. There's something greater that God is doing here. And Paul said, if I'm in chains, but the gospel advances, then I'm all for it. Listen to me. It's weird to preach to an empty room. <laughs> I'll be real. It's hard to lead worship to an empty room, I'm guessing. Come on, sing. No one's singing. Nobody. There's nobody there. They're not singing. But we got to lead worship like they are anyways. I'd much rather have our buildings full. But can I tell you this? We have double the people engaging every weekend than we ever did in our physical locations. So if the gospel is advancing, I'm rejoicing all the more. And you may not be able to see it right now, but I just tell you, God is working something. And so you can have joy. You can choose Joy, not because of your circumstances, but you can choose joy because of where you place your confidence. And here's what I found out that a crisis does. Choices make you, a crisis will reveal you. Choices make you, a crisis will reveal you. Here's the deal. A crisis works like a magnifying glass. And it magnifies the good, but man, it magnifies the area that needs some work too. Does it not? Have any of y'all felt that in this? Like, oh, Jesus, why you got to point that out? Yeah. You didn't say amen, Megan. <laughs> what if I did that on a real Sunday? Excuse me, third row. You didn't say amen. I'm going to do that when we get back together. <laughs> Everybody better watch out. They're going to be sitting in the back. I'm going to another campus, a video one who can't see me. But man, it works like a magnifying glass where it just magnifies the things that, and here's what I found out, it will magnify where your confidence is. It'll magnify if your confidence is in the, new, the latest news report, or what did the governor say, or what did the task force say, or when is this going to open, what's the date, what's the plan, where are we doing, and I understand all that is good, but where's your confidence? Is it in the report? It'll show you if your confidence is in your employer. It'll show you if your confidence is in your bank account. Man, a crisis will magnify some things so fast. And so Paul's in a crisis. He's, he's in a moment of pressure, and it magnifies this in the life of the Apostle Paul, that he had learned some way how to have his confidence in Christ. And so because of that, he could say, I have joy. I rejoice. He chose it. Can I tell you something? You have access to both. You have access to joy and you have access to negativity. The Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Oh, look at there. Love, joy. Love, joy. Joy. In other words, every day I have access to either choose joy, which is a supernatural thing God's given me, or I can choose negativity. I can choose joy or I can choose complaining. I can choose joy or I can choose to withdraw. I can choose joy or I can just use, choose to you know, spew all my fear and my doubt. I get the choice. I have access to both. I can choose joy. I love what Rick Warren said, the way he, he defined joy. I wrote it down because I wanted to read, read it to you. He said, joy is the settled assurance. In other words, I don't have to revisit it. I'm not, I'm not considering, I'm not still processing it. No, I've settled that God is in control of all the details of my life. And can I tell you something? God is in control of all the details of your life. All the details of your life. God is in control of them. Every small one. He said it's not only that, but it's the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right. Can I just look at you today? Look at me closely. It's all going to be okay. It really is. I don't know when. I don't have a date. But I know it's all going to be okay. That God is always working all things together for good. 
those who love him. So it's a quiet confidence that everything's going to be all right. And it's a determined choice to praise God in every situation. I'm going to praise God in every, I'm not praising him for it. Thank you, God, for Corona. Thank you. I don't believe God sent it. It's not in my theology. But I believe God can use everything for my good. And so in all things, the Bible says, I can give thanks because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. So he says, it's a settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life, the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right, and the determined choice to praise God in every situation. So you know what this tells me is that I have a choice to make. I can choose joy just like the Apostle Paul chose joy. But I can also choose something else. And I've just determined in this season, and I want you to determine in this season, that, I'm gonna, that you're going to choose joy, that you're not going to choose negativity, that you're not going to choose complaining, that you're not going to choose spreading doubt and spreading fear, and I'm not going to be a part of that. Have you noticed, I've just noticed, everybody's got, like the first few weeks of this, it was like, everybody's, and now it's like everybody's got an opinion. Everyone, everyone on social media is now an infectious disease doctor. Yeah. When did everybody become an infectious disease doctor? They, they like know how the virus is going to work, mutate, what's going to happen, what we should all do. That's funny. I've just determined I'm going to choose joy in the middle of this. And so if joy is in me, then I'm going to let joy out of me in the things I say, in the actions I take, in the posture I have, in the perspective I have, and you can choose joy. I like this. Someone said that joy is the expectation and the anticipation that something good is coming my way. You should just live every day waking up that I'm going to expect that something good is coming my way. No matter what I'm walking through, I have an expectation and an anticipation. I honestly do. I honestly have an expectation that no matter what I'm walking through, the end result is good for me and glory for God. That no matter what I'm going through, the end result is good for me and glory for God. It helps you choose joy through a valley in your life. That even in the valleys, it's going to end up good And it's going to end up for God's glory. And this isn't just like pie in the sky, like, like, you know, positive thinking or, or just feel better, say good things and, you know, it'll all turn out at the end. No, no, no. It's this. It's that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. It's that he has plans for me to prosper me and not to harm me, to give me a hope and a future. It's that his surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So every day I get up, goodness and mercy are following me all the days of my life. So if I walk fast, they're walking fast. If I run, goodness and mercy are chasing me down every day of the week. So it's just not like, oh, well, just feel better about yourself. No, I've anchored my confidence in God. And so where's your confidence? A crisis will reveal it. A crisis will work like a magnifying glass and show you where your confidence is. Paul had learned to anchor his confidence in God so he could say, even though I'm in chains, the gospel is advancing, and so I rejoice. Yes, I will continue with two palace guards flanking me. I've got joy. Under house arrest, joy. Can't see my people, joy. Can't go visit the churches I planted, joy. They may kill me, whether life or death, joy. Joy is a choice. So how did Paul have it? Three things real quick I want to give to you. Three things. Number one, and we see it in verse 19, it says this. Um, he said, yes, I will continue to rejoice. He says, for I know, um, let's throw that up there, for I know that through your prayers, keep going, next one, and the help, I guess I should do it like this, the help, <laughs> the help, one translation says, um, the provision, 
The provision that's given to me by the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Number one is this, is Paul's conf- he had confidence in God's provision. In other words, he had confidence that God's going to take care of me. I want that for you. I want you to have confidence that God's got you. God's going to take care of you. That God is, is working it for your good. And, and some of us, when we think provision, we think uh, so small when we think like financial provision. And, and God can do that. And he's told us how, to do, how, 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 how that works in the economy of the kingdom. You know, give and it'll be given back to you. That's how he, that's how he does provision. You know, return the tithe to the storehouse. I will open the windows of heaven over you and pour it a blessing. So he's, he's kind of given all that. There's no mystery to that at all. No mystery at all. But provision isn't just that. It's, it's mental provision. It's emotional provision. It's, it's physical, in your body provision. It's encouragement provision. And God says, I, Paul said, I got confidence that God will help me. God's going to provide for me. You know what's been a lifeline in this season? Um, Tammy and I, in our, our small group, just like, there's provision in that. Man, there's been so much provision just in, in connecting, having community, you know? If you're not in a small group, you need to get into a small group, be a part of an online small group. Why? Because I think that's one of the avenues God's using to give provision to people. Just like encouragement at the right time, a prayer, a word at the right time. Hey, I'm walking through this at the right time. You, you need those people in your life. God gives provision. I think Paul, though, could look over his life and look at the provision of God. And I would propose that all of us could do that as well. And so he wasn't just like hoping on the provision of God. No, he was looking back on the character of God and going, no, God did it in the past and God will do it again in my future. I think when he, when he was so transformed on the Damascus road there, I think he could look back and go, that was God's provision. And then, and then when he was training for three years, that was God's provision. And then, and then when he started planting churches and young Timothy come along to support him and, and be an assistant in the ministry, he sees that's provision. And then these churches that cared for him and, and that he longed for and he had this relationship, you see God's provision just all the way, all along the way, God's provision all along the way. He looked back and I just want to say to you is that in this season, God's not going to stop being who God has always been. That God will provide everything that you need according to his riches in glory through Christ Jesus. His provision came in the person of Jesus and will continue to flow through the person of Jesus. And so he was confident in God's provision. He said, I know that God's going to help me through the spirit of Jesus Christ. So he's confident in God's provision. Number two, he was confident in God's plan. I love this. He goes on to say, In verse 19, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. It will turn out for my deliverance. I love that. He he goes, no, God's God's got a plan in all this. God's got a plan in all this. I, I don't understand it all. I can't see it all. I can't make it all out, but I know God's got a plan in the middle of this, and it's going to turn out for my good, in other words. He said, what Paul, what I said earlier, he, Paul was saying, I know that deliverance is the end goal. I know that's, that's where it's going. It may be chains right now. It may be palace guards watching over me right now, but the end result is that I'm going to be delivered, and, and delivered either they're going to let me out of prison or I'm going to die. Either way, I'm delivered. Yeah. Paul was so anchored in his confidence in God's plan. I think because, see, in... Um, yeah, still, we're still good. Acts 28, get a little Bible teacher on you. Acts 28 is most likely the part where he was, that represents the two years he was in prison. But Acts 27, he was in Malta. So he's in Acts 28, he's writing to Philippi and he's writing to those people. But he had just taken a trip from, um, from um, Israel area over to Rome in a boat. And in that boat, if y'all remember on that trip, chapter 20, Acts 27, on that trip is where he went to Malta. He was shipwrecked. The snake bit him, the viper, they called him a God, then they called him a devil. And then he healed the whole land, right? His greatest miracle moment in all of his ministry, right? You remember that? So I think God, I think Paul could say, I got confidence in God's plan. And I just wonder if, if replaying in his mind wasn't, well, 
um, they put me on this boat and then we were shipwrecked and I thought we were all gonna die because that's what all they said, we wanna kill everybody and Paul goes, no, don't kill everybody. And then I get up there and I'm just trying to have a little wood ministry and like burning wood and you know make a fire because everybody's wet and cold now. And he goes, no, then a viper bit him and then no, that, that, that didn't kill him. And then he ended up praying over the, the leader of the island's father and he got healed. And then because of that, the whole island that was sick came to him and the whole island was healed and it was his greatest miracle in the ministry of the apostle Paul. And I wonder if he looked back and go, I did not understand the shipwreck and I didn't understand that viper hanging on my hand and I didn't understand why I didn't die from the bite of the viper. And he's trying to tell these Philippian church, I just want you to know that God has a plan. I just want to say to you, I could look back over my life and go, I don't understand why my dad got sick when I was in middle school and couldn't preach for seven years. And I don't understand why then in his old age, he got Alzheimer's and died from that. And I don't understand a lot of things out. But now that I look in hindsight, God had a plan all along the way. God was working something for my good, for his glory. All along the way, God had a plan. And so now I can put confidence in that. You know, today is uh, Dustin's last Sunday. Can y'all get him? Dustin's last Sunday with us. He's, um, he missed some lyrics this week, and so he's getting fired. I'm kidding, joking. Um, he's going to be over worship and production and creative and, and um, in church planning, other duties as assigned, which means anything else Pastor Sean needs you to do, that's what you do. That's right, it's the way it works when you start and forever. Um, but uh, they're moving to Louisville this week and um, just some of you may be wondering like what's happening with all that. We're moving forward. Church is moving forward. We haven't, we haven't put the pause button on anything. The gospel needs to be advanced and the method has always changed throughout human history. Um, and so um, anyways, I was just thinking about that like, uh, God doesn't always show you the end of the plan. Yeah. Like, you know the next step. Move there, you and Erica. Yeah. Move there. That's about all I got. It's about all you got right now. <laughs> but you can look back over your life yeah. and go, I got confidence for everything happening in Louisville yeah. because I've seen the hand of God in the past in my life, when he moved me from here to there, and then Virginia, and then it was Texas, and from Texas, I had to, and you can begin to connect the dots that, no, I got confidence in God's plan, and even though it was a viper in one place and a shipwreck in another place, at the end of the day, it was a miracle after miracle. It was sign after sign and wonder of God, and so I just want to show you today that if you'll look back over your life, you can start connecting the dots, and so I can have joy right now. I got joy, joy that I don't know where the church is going to meet in Louisville, joy that I don't know exactly what the next step is, joy, I got a house and that's about all I know at this moment, but joy, why? Because I'm confident in the plan of God and you can choose joy in this because your confidence isn't in your circumstance. It's that God is doing something bigger. and greater. And so finally, not only God's provision, God's plan, but God's purpose. Listen to what Paul said. He said, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed and will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Then he says this verse, I I think I was in middle school when my parents had me memorize it, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul was confident no matter what happened, the purpose of God would be fulfilled in his life. I think, I think he was so transformed that moment on the Damascus Road that changed everything. Changed everything. And that moment on the Damascus Road where the light shined bright and he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, it's me, you're persecuting. And he surrendered his life to Jesus. I think that moment so changed Paul that he surrendered agenda, he surrendered plans, he surrendered desires, he surrendered what he wanted his life to look like, he surrendered everything to Jesus And so he could get to this letter when he's under house arrest and write to the Philippians. And he goes in strong at the very first, I mean, usually beginning of a letter, you kind of want to soft roll that thing. But like he goes in strong and goes, I eagerly hope and I expect 
that Christ will be exalted in my body whether I'm living or dying. In other words, I want the purpose of God for my life. I didn't sign up for comfort. I didn't sign up for pleasantries. I didn't sign up for Christ when it's easy, Christ when there's no in home order. I didn't sign up for Christ only when, when all my needs are being met and all my bills are being paid. And, and I'm not downplaying the, the, the pain of that and the challenge of that. I'm just saying, would we get to a place in our life where our confidence is in God? May your purpose be exalted and may your purpose be accomplished in my life. And if that's me living on the earth, great. If that's me dying, great. But whatever, I'm surrendered to your agenda, God. Paul could say, I rejoice because he was confident that if he was in the earth, God was working. And if he was dead, he was in the presence of God. And either one worked for him. Either one worked for him. Can I tell you something? God's doing something in the middle of your waiting. Four books or letters of the New Testament would be written during those two years in prison under house arrest and multiplied millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of people have been impacted because Paul chose to win in the waiting. And can I tell you something? I don't know what God is doing in your life, but if you'll open your eyes and have eyes to see beyond the negativity and beyond the complaining and beyond the doubt and beyond everything going on around you and go, God, I want to have eyes to see what you're wanting to do with me. Could it be that thousands upon thousands upon millions of people would be impacted because you chose to win in the waiting and you started by choosing joy? You don't have to waste the waiting. You can win in the waiting. We're going to give you tools over this series on how to do that. I think it starts with choosing joy. Because my confidence is not in my circumstances. My confidence is in something greater than my circumstance, the person of Jesus. Will you pray with me? No matter where you're viewing from, every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're here today. And you can't say that your confidence, that your faith is in the person of Jesus. The Bible says... That if we'll confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God's raised Jesus from the dead, we will be saved. In other words, our sins will be forgiven. We'll know that we have a home in heaven. See, the Bible tells us that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's standard. And because of that, we're separated from God. Religion will tell you all the stuff you have to do to get to God. Christianity says this is all the things God did to get to you in the person of Jesus. And so today I offer you a free gift, the gift of eternal life, the gift of knowing your sins are forgiven, the gift of salvation. And if you say today, Pastor, I feel like in my heart that I'm far from God, then this moment is for you. And right there, no matter what room you're in, I want to invite you to pray this simple prayer with me. Our, our team here on the stage, we're going to pray this together with you out loud. You're not praying alone. And if you'll believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Not because Daniel said so, because the word of God says so. And so will you pray this with me out loud? Just say, Jesus, I need you. I believe you died for me. I believe God raised you from the dead. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. Give me a brand new beginning. Today I make you my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen to me. The Bible says all of heaven is rejoicing over one person. And I believe that there's just a party being thrown in heaven because of the decision that you made today. And I want to know about that. We want to help you in this journey of faith. We want to help you win while you're waiting. I want to send a free gift to you to help you in this journey. And so right there on the screen, you can see there's a number, 94,094,000. And just text the keyword right there when you would normally type the message. Type just this LC saved all together, L-C-S-A-V-E-D. Just type that right there. And then in the number where you'd normally put the number, just put 94,000. And we want, to, we want to know that you made that decision today. I want to send you a gift. So please 
let us know you made that decision. Hey, hope today's message was helpful for your life. I wanna tell you, you should subscribe. The reason why, you can get content pushed to you all the time. You don't have to wonder if you ever missed anything. And also, I want you to think about giving. By giving, you can help us take this message to so many other people that are in need of some hope, need of some encouragement, and you can be a part of making a difference in the life of so many people. Look forward to seeing you right back here next time.